Welcome to the Data Scientist Podcast with Dr. Stylianos Kabakis. Dr. Kabakis is a data scientist, statistician, and blockchain expert with a mission to educate the public about the wonderful capabilities of technologies like AI, data science, and DLTs. These technologies have the potential to transform the world, the economy, and our lives. However, there is too much misinformation around tech, and so most people are just confused about what is true and what is not. Whether you are a CEO, an entrepreneur, or just an enthusiast, the Data Scientist Podcast helps you separate reality from hype. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Podcast. Um, I have decided recently that uh, it would be a good idea to start on an interview series interviewing data scientists, entrepreneurs, uh, people that really have something to contribute to my audience. And uh, this is the first interview I'm, I'm running, and uh, we're very lucky to have Nick Jordan with us, um, who is founder at Narrative IO. And uh, Nick, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, I'm Nick, the the founder of Narrative. Um, you know, my my background. Uh, I'm not a data scientist. I'll, I'll say, you know, at at the top here. Although I like to pretend to be one on occasion. My, my background is in computer science. I have a, I have a degree in computer science and, and always thought I was going to be an engineer and, and pretty quickly pivoted in my career to being more of a, of a product manager. Uh, and, and most of my career has been focused at data-related uh, companies. So I spent a number of uh, years at Yahoo. Uh, I went to a startup called Demdex, which was acquired by Adobe. Uh, and then ran product management at a company called Tele- uh, TapAd, which was acquired by Telenor before starting narrative. And again, the through line is they were all very data focused companies and roles. Nice. So you're not a data scientist, but you've always been around data, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, I also remember when, when data science was, was less of an applied science and more of a research science. And, you know, when I, when I was at Yahoo and I actually think this may be even predate the term data science, but you know, the, you know, the PhDs in the field that were focused on data, were much more interested in, in publishing papers than they were developing software. Um, mm-hmm. And so that was probably my first exposure to what we, what we would now you know, call and, and treat as data science. Um, and and as, a, as a practitioner, it was, it was less useful to me, right? It, you know, a lot of great papers were created, but it was hard to take mm-hmm. that from theory in, into practice. And so it's, it's been great to see that data science has become much more of an applied science over the years. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've been guilty in the past of being on the other end of the spectrum, of being one of those people who would write the papers. <laughs> I feel I decided to focus on more applied stuff. So I can understand this. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the API- APIization of the data science function and the democratization of access to signal-rich data. Okay, so we, we said that today we would talk about this. And, and I wanted to ask you, what do you mean by the APIization of the data science Function and how does this rely, relate to democratizing access to signal rich uh, data? And I'd like to especially focus on these two points one is the APIization, and the other one is um, democratizing signal rich data, right? So, what yeah. do you mean by that? So, the, so the APIization is, is an interesting um, evolution that, that mm-hmm. relates to you know, the you know, data science going from a, a research science to an applied science, and so. You know, the way I think about it is, you know, historically, you know, a decade ago, you had researchers that were publishing algorithms and, and, and machine learning papers. Um, but oftentimes, you know, that research wasn't used in, in production grade systems, right? It wasn't, it wasn't scaled to the point that it could, you know, be used to, to run a product or, or, or run a business. And then, you know, that evolved into, you know, many of those data scientists often, you know, with, with their PhD sort of working hand in hand with data engineers to, to take, take the algorithms out of the, the papers and, and put them into production and, and focused a lot more on actually, you know, creating immediate actualized value for the companies that were using them. And, and the progression that we've begun to see is that, you know, a lot of the underlying techniques, a lot of the underlying algorithms are now being put behind, you know, what what can only be described as APIs, right? You know, and 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 oftentimes these are from cloud providers like AWS, but it's it's taking some of the things that historically the data scientists have done around tuning the algorithms and the you know hyperparameter optimizations, 
and making it so you don't need a, a you know, a, a degree in, in math or physics to do those things. You really just need to be able to, you know, call an API and behind the scenes, a lot of those optimizations and a lot of the, you know, the tuning are, are, are done automatically. Uh, and so that, that's what I mean by the API-ization of, of the data science function. Okay, this makes sense. And, and the thing I agree with you that in general, I think in computer science, we see higher and higher layers of abstraction being added on top of other things. So I guess operating systems is a good example, right? So we, <laughs> I'm not sure how many people in the audience remember DOS. And then when Windows became a thing, it was just huge. You know, we had the graphical user interface and maybe eventually we're going to reach a point where data science is just super easy and accessible to everyone, right? Through APIs. And you mentioned that we also want to talk about democratizing access to signal-rich data. And I want to ask you about what democratization means to you and for data. Also, what do you mean by signal-rich? I mean, have you encountered cases in the past where maybe you've, you know, you, you've worked with rich data which didn't really have much, many signals in them? <laughs> they were more like noise than signal? Yeah, I could say most of the data I've worked with in the past has been more noise than signal. So on the democratization side, you know, one of the ways we got to the APIization of data science is, you know, a lot of the techniques, a lot of the algorithms, a lot of the capabilities that have been developed by the classically trained data scientists in big organizations like Google and Facebook have actually been open sourced, right? You know, the, mm -hmm. the reasons you can layer APIs on top of them is they've taken these really novel techniques and, and made them available to the masses. And, you know, if those algorithms were coming out of research institutions, that would make a lot of sense. But one, you know, almost has to ask why someone like a Facebook or a Google is open sourcing, you know, what is arguably, you know, one of their competitive differentiations. And the conclusion that I've come to is that, you know, while the techniques are amazing, what really, you know, stands out at those organizations is the data they feed into those techniques. You know, the, you know, the algorithm without the input uh, is not nearly as valuable. Uh, and, 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 and obviously, if you're an Amazon or a Google or a Facebook, you have access to data sets that are, that are massive and uh, you know, are, are of a variety of different information and, and, and very signal rich. And so when we talk about the democratization, it's you know, how do you make data sets that maybe don't come from those organizations available to a broader set of entities, be it companies or researchers or, or individual data scientists? Because, you know, with the, the open sourcing of the techniques, you need to feed those, uh, th those things with, with information. And really the only way to do that is to have some way to make that data accessible by the masses and not just within the walled gardens that, that you know, traditionally have, you know, have succeeded there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I see. I see. What do you think have been some of the main challenges to getting access to signal-rich data? Yeah, well, so, you know, signal rich is an interesting point of itself, right? It's, you know, one person's signal is another person's noise. Correct. <laughs> depending, on what, depending on what you're trying to predict or what you're trying to model or, you know, what outcomes you're trying to understand, you know, not, not all data is, is created equal. And so, you know, I, I, think, I think historically, even that concept has been challenging. You know, people ask me all the time, like, oh, is this good data or is this bad data? And I say, well, you know, data mm -hmm. isn't good or bad. You know, data may provide signal for a particular, you know, problem that you're trying to solve or it won't pro solve problem, but, you know, short of the data just be, you know, being completely made up, you know, it doesn't have any, there's no, there's no good or bad, bad data. And so, you know, I think the, the real trick to, to the democratization of data is you have to be able to really quickly discover, uh, you know, access, test, uh, and then, um, you know, get full access to, to data is very quickly. And so historically, if you've, if you've been a data scientist and you're looking for a particular data set to help with a problem, you know, you probably have to either have the data internally in which, you know, your problem is, is purely, you know, either a technical or, or, or bureaucratic uh, problem. Or if you don't have the data, you know, already, you have to go find it. And that means you know, emailing people, calling people, trying to figure out who has the, the data that you're looking for, convincing them to send it to you, testing your hypothesis, you know, to see if the data was even valuable. Um, and, and, you know, you don't have to do that once, potentially, you may have to do that dozens of times. So what historically has stopped the democratization is friction. It's just, it's, there's no easy way to find 
you know, all of the data, you know, that you know has been created in the world to find the stuff that's actually going to be value for your your problem statement. And so, you know, kind of the our, our focus at narrative is how do you how do you take that problem, you know, friction of of sort of the access of of data and remove as much of it as possible, make as much of that programmatic as possible in in the same way that you know the 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 you know the democratization or the apiization of of the models themselves has removed a lot of the friction on that side. So how does narrative work? I mean, I went through your web page and I see that it's a data streaming platform. Um, I've been hearing um, you know lately terms like data streaming, data mesh, uh, more and more often. So would you like to walk our audience through that and try to provide a simple explanation for those who've never encountered uh, data streaming before? Yeah, and so the easiest way to think about the narrative platform is is um, almost as a marketplace, right? And so you know we 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 broadly have two sides participating in this marketplace. We have companies that have data that want to make that data available uh, to to data scientists or, or or product managers or analysts, and then we have the data scientists and product managers and analysts on on, on the other side. And and so um, the, it's you can almost think of it as a marketplace with programmatic access. So the ability for both the sell side and, and the buy side or the, you know, the, 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 the supply and the demand to define what they, you know, what they want to sell, what they want to buy, uh, you know, in, in very precise terms. And so, you know, from a, from a data scientist perspective, they may be looking for a particular data set, but they're really only interested in, in records within that data set that have a particular attribute. And so being able to say that up front find where that data might live uh, from the supply side and very quickly and programmatically access it so they can go feed it into their models and, and, and test their hypothesis. And if their hypothesis turns out to be true, if the, if the data is signal, uh, you know, to, to get a continuous feed of that data streaming into their model uh, and, and, and again, in, in an automated way. Uh, okay, so what you're doing basically is you connect uh, companies that want to consume data with data providers, if, if I get this right, yeah? That's right. And, and you know, part of the trick is to do it in a way that both parties know who each other are, right? It's not, it's not opaque, right? You're not buying data from narrative. You're buying data from, from the data provider. Um, and also to give really fine-grained controls to both sides. So, you know, historically, you know, we've thought about data as being a data set, um, which, you know, all, any, arguably any data with more than one record is, is a data set. But there might be some, you know, some subset of that data that's really rich in signal and some, you know, subset of that data that is, is mostly noise. And so giving, giving the data consumers, you know, control to make sure that they're, they're pulling in the, the, the signal and eliminating the noise which you know saves them time downstream when they're trying to do you know feature selection and and and, and you know the the more uh, you know robust data science techniques uh, once they start using the data. Uh, how is this better than just being a data broker? So let so you know let's say that I have the option to simply I don't know um, let's download some data around I don't know a theme like finance or whatever. Uh, from you know from, from some broker, all right, and then I have the option to go through through your solution. I mean, what's 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 the difference? So transparency number one. So if you're buying data from a data broker, it looks like it's coming from the data broker. So you don't know yeah. where they've actually gotten the data from. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's more commercially efficient, right? To the extent that there's a a data broker sitting between the supply and demand, that data broker is marking up the data, and there's some cost. You know, to to the end user, you know, it's a you know, I often you know this is a bit you know sort of economic theory a little bit, but you know I see data brokers um, you know as effectively the middlemen in a, in a transaction. Mm. And as the market becomes more efficient, it, it it really can't support middlemen that are that are doing you know effectively arbitrage in in the middle. And in fact, that's you know almost the definition of an inefficient market. Now, yeah. a broker makes complete sense in 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 a burgeoning market or a market that doesn't have a ton of liquidity uh, early on, but I think as participants become more sophisticated, you want less intermediaries in, in the chain. Um, and then, you know, the, the other big value is, is optionality. So, you know, there, there is a cost to working with a, any, any data provider, uh, you know, and especially a data broker. 
And the, there's switching cost. If you decide, well, this data broker isn't providing me the information I want anymore. I'm going to go work with another data broker. They're going to send the data in a different file format. You're going to have to do a different contracts. And, and all of those have costs. And so, you know, ultimately by using our platform, you have the optionality to switch the providers you're working with. You can combine data sets from multiple providers. You can normalize data sets across multiple providers. And so a lot of the upfront heavy lifting that you typically would have to do is eliminated. Mm-hmm. I see. So essentially, if, for example, you know, I want the data on Facebook users, then I can just uh, connect directly with apps that are providing this data, and I can do this through narrative, right? Narrative.io. So I don't really have to go through a data broker, which has aggregated data from Facebook users. This is what I can do using narrative, correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Well, I understand what you're saying. So essentially, you are creating, uh, you, you're trying to provide the more frictionless middle layer, essentially. So you're just helping companies connect with other companies that want to digest the data, companies that produce data and companies that digest the data. And you're not really, you know, doing much uh, processing or, or aggregation, uh, which I, I guess it helps a lot with transparency and I guess flexibility, right? I can imagine that you, you someone probably can find all kinds of data sources on, on narrative. Is, is this correct? That, that that's exactly right. I, you know, one of the you know, I don't I don't know how how old your audience is, but the analogy I like to use is you know, when I was when I was a kid, and my family was going to go on vacation, we would go to a travel agent, right? We would, mm-hmm. we would yes. literally, literally drive to <laughs> to an office somewhere and say we would like to go to Florida, mm-hmm. and that travel agent would call us a week later and be like, well, here's you know, I've I've created a couple of options for you. You could go to this hotel and in Miami, or you could go to this hotel in Tampa. And, you know, depending on the hotel you choose, it'll be these flights. No one does that to go on a, on a vacation anymore. Although arguably at this point, no one goes on vacation anymore, but if they, if they were to go on vacation, <laughs> you know, they would, they would go to Expedia, they would type in where they want to go. And all of that's done instantaneously without, you know, someone sitting in an office with a, with a binder full of, of pictures of, of beaches. And it's very equivalent. You know, the, the data broker in, in that model is the, is the travel agent and, and we are, you know, the Expedia or, or Priceline of the world. Mm-hmm. So I think, that's a, I think that that's a great model, but I guess from my experience, there are some cases where the broker is also the one generating the data. So like you have, for example, you know, in the, in the sports world, you have companies like, company like Opta, which collects, uh, which is actually now it's part of uh, Stats Perform, I think, mm-hmm. which collects sports data and they have their own technology. So they have all these cameras and uh, they have their own processes and people who are watching these cameras and they're recording data manually and then someone else checks the data and blah, blah, blah. So that's a case where someone is actually, a company is gener- collecting the data, generating the data and also selling these data as packages. So do you see that data streaming could also help in this solution or do you think that there's always going to be a niche for data brokers of this kind as long as they're also the ones that essentially have a monopoly on collecting their data? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say our, our solution is definitely um, stronger in where there's fragmentation, right? If there, if there were three of those companies collecting that data and you as a, as a, as a data user wanted access data from all three of those companies, it'd be much easier for you to do it from a single platform versus having to go to all three of them individually. But I, but I will say we do have a, 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 a supply side solution um, because historically, even companies that have sold data, they've not done it in a way that makes it easy for buyers to access the data. And I'm not even talking right. you know, from a price perspective, like just the technology it seems to be an afterthought, right? They, they have data, people want it, and then you know everything from there on out is manual. And so we have solutions for suppliers that can make their data available, you know, in more friendly ways via APIs, um, you know, make it easier to, to have potential buyers browse the data sets and really understand what data they want access to and what data they don't want access to. And so, you know, that, that side of our business is very analogous to, to Shopify. So if you're, if you're selling a physical product and you want to create an online store, you probably don't want to create the technology to actually run the e-commerce. You just want to, you know, you, your, your expertise is building in the physical good. And so we're building, a, you know, effectively storefronts for companies that are, that are generating their own data and then trying to bring it to market in a way that's, you know, a little bit more elegant than, than what they've done historically. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Okay, great, great. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. And 
the, I'm pretty happy we're having this conversation now because I think what we're describing is essentially a future trend in data science. I say future because it's already happening, but I don't think that many people have caught up on it. And I believe that in the next couple of years, we'll hear more and more about data streaming and removing the middleman. I'm really curious to see what kind of solutions we're going to see out there. I guess the end result is that the consumer and the data scientists will get access to better quality data. So that's good. And yeah, that that being said, I'd like to to move on to our last question for for today. And the question is, what do you believe the evolution of data science will look like over the coming years with the commoditization of machine learning models and parameter tuning techniques? Yeah, so... Uh, you know, again, I think this goes back to, you know, the, I think the data becomes paramount. I, I think, you know, we won't hit any hard ceiling with data science anytime soon. I mean, you know, we'll continue to see, you know, innovation and deep learning and, and you know, spaces that, you know, I, I, I probably can't even fathom at this point. But I, I do think that, you know, the, the data scientists within organizations to, you know, if they're, if they're really looking for step function improvements in, in a lot of their, their models, you know, they're going to have to be really, um, uh, really adept at finding the data uh, that helps improve those models, testing it, uh, and then moving on to their next hypothesis. You know, I, I, I do like the data science is, is referred to as such because I actually think, you know, a good data scientist is, is constantly coming up with hypotheses and then testing those hypotheses and, and, and constantly improving not just the, the techniques, but the underlying model themselves. And I, and I think that is what the, the, the future looks like, is a, is a much you know, more robust, a much quicker uh, iterative path within organizations instead of what today you know, I, I find in most organizations, the models and, and the data sets are often you know, much more static than, than you know, I think is, 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 is ideal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. So you're essentially you're imagining a more flexible and dynamic future, let's say, right, with regards to machine learning. Yeah, and and we, and we see this almost in every, every in every discipline, right? Like you, you starts out and you, you know, right. then it works, and then it's and it's fairly static, and then you know over time, you know, it's like capitalism, right? You know, the 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 the, the underlying you know measurement of capitalism is productivity. Like how productive can you can you make the workforce, and that's how successful in some ways capitalism is, and. I think you know it'll be similar in, in data science or really any any science is you know how quickly can you iterate how quickly can you hypothesize how quickly can you move on to the next best theory of of you know you know what whatever you're trying to do whatever your discipline is and the, the faster you can do that the the better and I think that's going to be the movement going forward. Yeah, I mean I, I, I can agree with this, right? I think we're going to see more and more flexibility, uh, faster and faster transactions. Um, besides data science, I think we're seeing this in the technology space with technologies like blockchain uh, trying to revolutionize the financial system uh, and also other uh, systems that include heavy operations like supply chains. Uh, and talking about society in general, you mentioned earlier about travel agents. And again, I think removing, I mean, travel agents are still around, but not at the same scale because with Airbnb, the internet, and, and, and related services like like a, to Airbnb, like booking.com, etc. It has become much easier to, to make your own decisions, to access information. You can be more flexible. And I think one way or another, like, like you said, uh, we're going to witness more flexibility and, and options in, in the domain of data science and, uh, and pr- pretty much in, 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 any, in anything. But yeah, since this is a data scientist podcast, now we're um, yeah, we just focused on that. Uh, so great. I think this was, uh, this was great input. And um, it was great to hear about data streaming. It, it was great to hear about, about narrative.io. Uh, and uh, I think it was a very interesting uh, discussion. <laughs> Yeah, I I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nick. So before we conclude, uh, would you like to share with our audience um, how can they find you? How can they find Narrative? So Narrative is at narrative.io on the web. Uh, On Twitter, we are at narrative underscore io. And I can be found on Twitter uh, occasionally talking about data science and occasionally talking about things like sports and you know, the global economy uh, at, at Nick underscore Jordan. Perfect. Okay. I'll actually send you an invite on Twitter right now. I'm not sure we're connected. <laughs> Amazing. 
Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for being here with us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this interview and this episode of The Data Scientist, and I hope to see you again soon. Uh, thanks, Nick. We'll speak soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Make sure to visit thedatascientist.com for more content about data science, AI, and blockchain.